in the Marriott Hotel in downtown oh, wow. San Francisco. And she was apprehended with a bucket of gasoline and, and, and lighters, and she was apprehended in there was no damage, but she was charged with you know, terrorism and arson and other th attempted arson and other things. And it was this tr the trial um, was attended by the entirety of the Vietnamese community in San Francisco. And I remember them, the Marshal Service was very concerned about security, and they were taking everyone's big lighters, and they were concerned about there being a fire or something like that. But the courtroom was packed standing room only, and there was never a sound made by any of these, for the most part, older uh, Vietnamese wow. uh, immigrants watching this trial. And I recall one of the big issues was whether or not this woman should be allowed to tell her story about her escape mm -hmm. from communist Vietnam and about the atrocities were, that were perpetrated on uh, her family and her people. And the government really resisted that, and I really thought, you know, it's likely she's going to be convicted of at least the attempted arson. You know, she's probably, and if she is, that was a mandatory uh, five-year mm -hmm. prison sentence. All she's ever wanted was to be heard, mm -hmm. and I overruled all of those objections, and I let her tell her story, and she came into court with full garb um, um, from her um, ancestral village, mm -hmm. And she told this very eloquent story, and she spent several hours. Mm -hmm. The jury was wrapped. Yeah. It didn't, it did not in any way persuade them or dissuade right. them from doing their duty, and they returned a verdict of guilt on at least the attempted arson. But she felt really satisfied with having been given that opportunity to speak before this audience of her people, and to this day, she still sends me Christmas cards. She's wow. out of prison, she's back in France, she still sends me cards. That to is this amazing. day, thanking me for allowing her to have her day in court, even though I had to sit and serve in prison for five years. Wow, that's really yeah. amazing. So that, that's uh, one of my memorable cases. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what, in terms of being a judge, what is the biggest challenge that you feel like you deal with? Oh, just the workload. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just the workload. Okay. And that workload recently has, uh, I hope, changed a little bit because now you're, of course, the chief judge, and uh, that's you've taken that role on for the last few years. And um, I would love to know a little bit about that transition from Article 3 to being a chief judge and um, how that opportunity arose for you and how you decided to take it. The, in the federal system, mm -hmm. one is not elected to or appointed to the chief judge rule on the trial court level. It uh, uh, happens by operation of statute. I'm the most senior judge who is not yet turned 65. That's how I ended up. Mm -hmm. uh, having the, the position available to me. Of course, I didn't have to take it, and I had a little hesitancy. I wasn't really sure I was going to be as interested in the administrative responsibility or the sort of public responsibility being the case of the court. Um, and, uh, and I wasn't sure about the support of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, having been with the court for a couple of dozen uh, years already, I knew that there were some chiefs who were more supported than others by our colleagues, and we're a very collegial bench, and I'm very lucky in that mm -hmm. regard. But I was a little concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And I uh, talked to Felton Henderson, who had been a chief, who I knew also was reluctant to take it when it was his turn. And, and uh, after talking with him, I pretty much decided that, that he had been the first African-American chief judge. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were certain aspects of it that he liked and certain that he didn't. Um, but he impressed upon me the importance of people in our position being out there, mm -hmm. you know, being the public face of the court, uh, just because of our, uh, our responsibilities to our communities, our opportunities to be role models for young lawyers coming behind us, uh, for women lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of reluctantly agreed to do it. 
But within a week, I realized it was absolutely the right thing for me to do, and I love being chief judge, and I love the administrative responsibilities, and the being the public face of the court as well. And I think what I've learned in the uh, few years that I have been chief uh, judge is that I have an entirely different way of doing things mm -hmm. than other people. And uh, my reception by the lawyers has been just tremendous. They tell me they've never had as much access as they have with me. They, lawyers email me directly. I, mm -hmm. we, they, we don't stand on ceremony. They don't have to go through my secretary in order to reach me. Just send me an email if something's going on. I make myself available to them, the lawyer representatives who work for us, the, who do so much work for, for the Federal Bar Association that does work for the court. I make myself uh, readily available to them. I like having an informal relationship mm -hmm. with all of them. Uh, and I realized that um, someone like me, my personality is different, I'm not a terribly formal person, um, I think there's some benefits to have different kinds of leadership. Mm -hmm. But in addition to the public face of the court, there's a lot of administrative responsibility. There's no one on my court that's as detail-oriented as I am, that likes to get into the weeds as much as yeah. I do about you know, the policy, the process, the procedures. And I have to say that the support that I get from the judges mm -hmm. of my court is tremendous. Mm -hmm. It's tremendous. It really makes being chief worthwhile. They appreciate that I'm going to get into the details. They don't worry about it. They call, they drop a problem on me, and they know I'm going to take care of it. And I like that. Yeah. And this has sort of allowed me to tap on a tap into a different skill set, mm -hmm. my management skills. I think I'm a really good manager and administrator. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a good way for me to wind down my career by doing something in other than the case uh, the cases. I have a reduced caseload, and so I'm spending a lot more of my time on administrative responsibilities. And I think a lot of people don't like that, yeah. but I do, and I think my court's really lucky to have someone who really likes it. Right. And I feel a great deal of appreciation from the judges in my court and from the staff of my court because I am bringing a right. different approach. That's great. Um, and I know we're running short on time, so I have two more questions for you. One is uh, as you are, you know, sit. Uh, in the chief judge spot and you look back on your career and as you say, you begin to think about winding down your career. Um, how does it feel when you take stock of where you are now and you look back on where you started and you remark on you know everything that came in between? How do you feel? I feel incredibly lucky. I feel incredibly blessed to have had this opportunity. I don't know what I did in my former life. Well, let me use this analogy. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think that uh, by having met and married the man that I met and married, that the higher powers were telling me, mm -hmm. you've, you've been a good girl. Mm -hmm. You know, because I never would have thought that I deserved uh, the kind of marriage that I had. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel that way about my career, yeah. and my, and particularly my uh, career at the Northern District of California, I don't know what I did in my life to deserve such good fortune. Mm -hmm. And I will be forever grateful that um, the judges appointed me as a magistrate judge and that President Clinton appointed me as a district judge. Because aside from um, my marriage, this is the most fulfilling uh, mm -hmm. part of, of my life. Wow. Um, and then slightly related, but on a different note, if you imagine there to be other, you know, small children just starting out, perhaps not in the uh, most likely of circumstances that will lead them to a position like yours, is there any advice that you would give them having lived the life that you've lived and had the career you've had uh, as, you know, I don't know, words of wisdom or a parting, you know, remark that you would leave? I, I think I would simply say strive to be the best person you can be because the qualities that you admire in your mother, for me, mm -hmm. my aunt, mm -hmm. those are the qualities that I think are going to take you the farthest in mm -hmm. life. 
I would say guard your reputation. It's the only thing over which you have any control. Uh, and, and once it's gone, it's gone. I've been very lucky to advance because my reputation has been good. Um, and I would say, um, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah. yeah. Just strive to be the best person you can be. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. It's been very nice to hear uh, all of your experiences, and it's really been a wonderful uh, lesson in many ways, and, and really wonderful to have you share it. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Claudia.